believer, someone who knew Jesus Christ. Why? Because there is unbelievable hope there. And um, Paul talks about that. If if would not for the hope of Jesus Christ, what else is there? And so I've done funerals in which people didn't know the Lord, and there was not much hope that I could give as far as the person who was deceased, but I could give hope to the people that were there to let them know that through Jesus Christ that they can have life. And so uh, we've had um, several, probably more than several, that have gone to be with the Lord in our congregation the past uh, three or four years. And, uh, but what a privilege that it has been for me to be able to officiate and to take part in those um, celebration services because we know where they are, right? They're in heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with uh, Jesus Christ. And, um, and so Vern and, and Harry and, and all those who have gone before, uh, and Walter and Frank and... and uh, Think about the choir that they're singing in this morning. Why, what that must sound like. We're going to see that when we get to chapter 4 and chapter 5 in the book of Revelation. And let me ask you, could Vern sing? Yes. He could sing? All right, good. Well, I can't imagine what that voice sounds like right now. And uh, they are in heaven in that heavenly choir. The Bible talks about myriads and myriads and myriads of angels and uh, those created beings who are giving praise and worship to God. Uh, what a sight uh, that is now, I'm sure. And what a sight it will be. And Angela, too, yes, singing. She's right in front, just where she sang right here. Right in front, belting it out to all those who have gone before. How awesome is that? There's a part of me that says, I can't wait. Really. But then there's another part of me that says, we got work to do, right? We've got work to do as believers, as a church, uh, to see people come to know uh, the Lord. Uh, just a couple of announcements for us here. Uh, ladies' Bible study is going to be beginning very soon, uh, on September 8th, right? On Wednesday morning from 9.30 to 11.30, Bobby is going to be uh, facilitating, assisted by Pat, and, and uh, just uh, there's a lot of interest so far. Brochures have been taken, and so ladies, you want to be part of that coming up in about a week and a half. It's hard to believe that almost, August is almost over, and September is almost here. And uh, also, after the service this morning for members, uh, we are voting on the roof. The roof is going up coming down first and then going up. And so be a very, very, very brief meeting, enough to get in and get the vote and, and to move out. And we had a good meeting the other night, those who had questions or concerns, and we addressed those. And so here we are to the vote today. And so we move ahead, right? Amen. All right, let's, uh, we're in Revelation chapter 3. We're finishing up uh, this particular chapter. And again, the notes that are in the back that, were, uh, that you saw on your way in, these are the chapter 3 notes beginning next week. Uh, we'll be beginning chapter 4. And so those notes will be there available, not only here, but also you can go on our website uh, and click on sermon notes and uh, you can pick up a PDF file and they can print it off or just kind of read it there. And so all of the notes and all of the sermons video are, are available on our website. They're available on our Facebook page and also on YouTube. Just look up Stanton or Staunton if you're not from the area, baptistchurch.net, the website. And uh, just do that search and you can catch us on Facebook or YouTube as well. And so we're in chapter 3, uh, we're finishing up this chapter. You remember uh, John was told to write this letter uh, to seven literal churches that existed back then, and you see those churches there up on uh, the map, seven uh, churches that existed that were experiencing problems, uh, problems that the church faces today. And so I believe that the problems, uh, the issues that are dealt with uh, in each of these churches are issues in which churches deal with today. Uh, you remember in chapter 1, verse 19, uh, John is really giving us an outline of the book of Revelation. Uh, write down the things that you see, chapter 1. Write down the things that are, chapters 2 and 3. 
and then the things that which must soon take place. That's chapter 4 through verse 22. And again, I believe that the book of Revelation was given to us chronologically, and so we're going to be following chronologically along. And so right now, chapters 2 and chapters 3 are the church age in which we live. You remember the church age is from the time that the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost to the time that the rapture of the church uh, is going to occur. That's the church age. That's the the issues that we're looking at now in chapters 2 and 3. There are some who believe that maybe perhaps these seven churches uh, represent the church age through the years. Uh, There have been those who have done a study on that. I've kind of delved into that. Uh, Some of it is pretty clear and some of it is um, kind of obscure because we don't know all of the details looking back at history. But there are those who believe that we are living in the age in which the the issues with the Laodicean church uh, are going to be dealt with as we're going to see this morning. And so if that's the case... Uh, With the church at large, we're in trouble, okay? And so let's look here at this church at Laodicea. First of all, you remember the the church in Ephesus was a zealous church. Uh, They were doing all of the things outwardly that should be done, but yet they were missing the first love of Jesus Christ. The church in Smyrna was a persecuted church. Now, there were no complaints about this church. Uh, They were going through some very, very, very difficult times, much like what believers are going through and the church is going through even in Afghanistan today. Uh, The freedom to be able to worship has been curtailed, if allowed at all. So this was the church in Smyrna the persecuted church. The church in Pergamon was the corrupted church. They had allowed things uh, to come in uh, to the congregation that was very, very, very open. And so so Christ uh, implores them uh, to repent of what they are doing. The church in Thyatira, church number four, was the permissive church. They had allowed things to come into the church that were happening behind the scenes and you remember Jesus appears uh, with the blazing eyes and uh, to expose all of these things that were wrong because uh, they were causing this church to die. The church in Sardis was the dying church. Uh, they were lifeless. There was no zeal there. They had resorted to traditionalism and, and formalism. And, and so the uh, counsel there was for this church to wake up. Wake up of of the dying that you're going through. And then last week we looked at uh, the church in Philadelphia. Uh, This was the faithful church. God had opened the door of this church for evangelism. Remember, uh, they were situated on a major highway going east to west. And so many people passed through uh, this, uh, this town of Philadelphia. And so God had opened the door for this church for evangelism. And so if you were to look at these, you could probably find Stanton Baptist Church in there at one time or another or even today. And so this day we're going to be looking at uh, the last church, the church of Laodicea. And then after we get through this, then we're going to uh, partake in communion. Those of you who are watching from home, uh, grab some grape juice or some crackers or bread, and, and we'll be partaking co- communion to end our service here this morning. But look, let's look at this church, to the church in Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea. Remember, the angel was the pastor, the leadership there at these particular churches. Write this, John. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to what? I am about to spit you out of my mouth. This is pretty hard right here, hard hitting. You say, church, that I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and and I do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched and pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. 
And so I counsel you now to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. We're going to explain that in just a little bit. And buy white clothes to wear so that you can cover over your shameful nakedness. And also salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Interesting that he uses those particular examples right there. And we'll talk about that. Those whom I love I rebuke and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. And then I love this picture. You may have seen the picture uh, through the years of, of Jesus Christ knocking on the door of a house. This is where this was taken from. Uh, Behold, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So who's talking here? This is Jesus Christ, right? Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says now to the churches. Now let's go da- back now and, and break this down. First of all, uh, the city or the town of Laodicea, it was about 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia. You can see it there, or I'm sorry, of um, uh, yeah, of Philadelphia. Uh, it was extremely wealthy, probably one of the wealthiest cities in the area. Uh, they were famous for their finances. They had a tremendous banking system there. And so you'll see Christ refer back to riches several times to this message. Uh, the people here were very self-centered. Um, there was, it was a place for wealthy people uh, to retire. So it was a very well-to-do city. Uh, it was famous for its hot springs. Um, there was clothing. Clothing was famous. If you were wearing an outfit from Laodicea, you would arrived, man. You were there because it was equivalent to uh, wearing, I don't know, Armani today, I guess is that a, a good brand name, versus Walmart right here, okay? And so here they are. Now, they were famous for their garments. Uh, the wool of Laodicea was a luxury item. Uh, there were temples and schools in this uh, particular city. Uh, there was also a famous medical school that was famous for a salve that you would use on your eyes uh, for the healing of the eyes. And so they were famous for banking, they were famous for their wool, and they were also famous in the areas of medicine, especially with regard uh, to the eyes. Uh, The one thing bad about this city was they had a poor water supply. And so the water had to be piped in via aqueduct uh, from other places. And so by the time the water arrived there in Laodicea, it was full of sediment and it was warm and not very tasteful. And so uh, you would see, if you read back in history, some of the other accounts, uh, people would drink the water and kind of spit it out of their mouth because of the taste. And so uh, Christ now, his message to this particular church has much to do with the physical reality of what uh, this particular city was uh, going through. Now, this particular church was founded uh, by Epaphras. You may recognize the name. He was one of the uh, converts uh, from the Apostle Paul there in Ephesus. And so Epaphras went out and, uh, through Paul's help, founded this particular church uh, here in uh, Laodicea. And so Christ appears now to this church threefold. First of all, he appears as the amen. Now, what does the word amen mean? Does anybody know? What's that? Let it be, or um, uh, somebody said it over here. Uh, So be it. It's like an exclamation point at the end. In other words, this is what it is, exclamation point. And so Christ appears now uh, to this church with an exclamation point with regard to the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. In fact, he said it himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. And so uh, all of God's promises now appear truthfully with an exclamation point through Jesus Christ. And so uh, the promises then that are given us in the Word of God, which are for us as believers, are guaranteed exclamation point 
through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus appears as his exclamation point. He appears also as the faithful and true witness. Witness to what? Well, witness to creation, witness to the fact that he came and he died and he was buried and that he rose again. In fact, a reliable witness will, will um, have three criteria. Number one, he must have seen with his own eyes. I mean, Jesus was there from the beginning, wasn't he not? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And who is the Word? Jesus Christ, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so he must have seen it with his own eyes. He must be absolutely honest so that he repeats with accuracy. You remember what Jesus said, I will only tell you what my Father tells me. And then number three, he must have the ability to tell what he has to say. And obviously Jesus did that, one of the greatest teachers that ever lived. But if he was just a great teacher... That's all he would have been, right? But he was the Son of God who came and rose from the dead. And then he's introduced also as the ruler of God's creation. Jesus was there at the beginning with God when, when the earth was created. Um, there are those who lived back then and who also live today who will try to purport that Jesus Christ was a created being. Just as Satan was a created being, so was Jesus Christ. Uh Uh-uh. Jesus was with God there at the beginning when everything was spoken into existence. Jesus always was, he always is, and always will be. And so he is the ruler of all creation. In fact, the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will eventually bow and every tongue will eventually confess that what? That Jesus Christ, he is Lord. He's the ruler of all creation. And so you remember the outline with each of these churches. Jesus is introduced and then there is a commendation, something good that this church is doing. And then there is a rebuke, then there is a warning, and then there is a promise. Now with this particular church, there is no condemnation or commendation. Uh, There is nothing good. In fact, this church has the distinction among all of the others as being the only church in which God had nothing good to say, at least in his message uh, to this particular church. In fact, the complaint was this, God says, I know your deeds. And I have to go back to that, and we've seen this with all of the churches. God knows our deeds. When we think we're doing things and no one else sees, guess what? God sees us. God sees us. And so he tells this church, I know your deeds, that they are neither hot nor cold. Interesting uh, that the city of Hierapolis, which was very near them, was famous for their hot springs. Near them also was the city of Colossae, which was known for its cold mountain water. And so you had the hot springs on one end, you had the cold springs on another, and here they are known for their lukewarm water. Because you remember, it was piped in. And so God uses the illustration here of the reality of what they were going through. You're neither hot nor you're cold, nor are you cold, but you are lukewarm. And just as when people visited the town and they would taste the lukewarm water and spit it out, God says, I am also about to spit, about to spit you out as well. Those are strong words. Because, you see, God was desiring that this church would either be hot or either be cold, either be hot for me, to be zealous for Jesus Christ, or, you know what, just kind of forget it. But don't be in the middle. Have you ever kind of sat on a fence with one leg on either side? Very uncomfortable, isn't it? You don't want to stay there too long. And so God's saying, you got to get out. you got to be either hot or you have to be cold. And so their hypocrisies sicken Christ in an unbelievable way. And so um, I don't know if you ever, you know, have you ever eaten a, a, um, a warm bowl of cereal that's meant to be cold? Yeah, it just doesn't taste the same. Man, I like ice cold milk on my cereal, Honey Nut Cheerios or, or um, Cocoa Krispies and, and all of those things that are not good for you. Those are the cereals I like. But I like putting nice cold milk on top of it uh, or hot. I mean, I like the, the food that's supposed to be hot. I like it hot, right? 
I remember when uh, in high school and playing football, uh, we would get home very, very, very late, and my family usually ate dinner at 5 o'clock, and so I would sometimes get home about 7 or 7.30, and my mom was a tremendous cook, still is, but she would fix our dinner at 5. And so by the time 7 or 7.30 hit, the late bus brought us home, the, uh, the it wasn't as hot as it was when she first cooked it. In fact, you could take the plate and go like this, and it would kind of stick to the plate because that's the reality. Was because we were late. It just food doesn't hot food that's meant to be hot doesn't taste good when it's lukewarm. Same thing with cold. And so he's saying here, I wish that you were one or the other. You see, this church had become indifferent. This church had become complacent. Uh, uh, they were satisfied with the status quo. They were satisfied with the norm. They wanted to be neutral. They didn't want to be one or the other. Uh, they were somewhat alive, but uh, they were dead. It was a dead church. You see, in this particular city, and that had permeated the church, that riches had taken prominence. Um, acquiring wealth was what gave you status uh, back here. Um, but their wealth that they had acquired wasn't being used for good. It wasn't being used for uh, the church and things spiritually. In fact, they were poor spiritually. Even though they were rich, then Christ uses the metaphor here of the fact that they weren't rich, but they were poor spiritually. Um, what they needed took a back seat to what they wanted. And so they had everything that they wanted, but they didn't have what they needed, and so they were poor in spirit. Uh, they were blind. Again, he uses the metaphor from the fact that they had a famous medical school there. They were blind to the truth. Uh, they were blinded by their wealth. Uh, Paul told the church in, uh, in Corinth, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Not only that, but talking about clothing, he says you are naked spiritually. You see, when we come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, Paul says that we are clothed then with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are clothed then with His righteousness. And so when God looks down and He sees every one of us, He no longer sees us, but He sees the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ, on us. And he said, this church, this church in Laodicea, you are naked spiritually. And you are unclothed, and you are not able to see, and you are poor in spirit. This church was going downhill very, 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 very quickly. And so how does he counsel them here? In fact, they were becoming monuments. Do you know a church that has become a monument? They have gone through the years, and maybe at one time they were full of life, but now it's just a building, and it's just a few people, and, and nothing's going on there. Uh, this church was quickly becoming a monument, and Christ had nothing but harsh words uh, for them. In fact, here's how he counsels them. I want to counsel you three ways. First of all, buy gold refined in the fire. Remember, they're a tremendous banking uh, town. Buy gold refined in the fire. You see, they needed spiritual riches. They didn't need any more of the gold that the world had to offer. Why? They had all of it that they needed, but they needed gold from Christ. Uh, Peter says this, These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. In other words, take your mind off of the riches and place your mind on the riches that come through Jesus Christ. You see, they were physically wealthy, but they were spiritually very, very, very poor. And uh, you've heard this. I mean, wealth does not buy happiness. It will not buy health. Uh, I've read accounts of men who had it all or women who have had it all and on their deathbed only wished that they had enough money to cure them of what they were going through and they would soon pass into eternity. Why? Money can buy none of that. But yet what we have in Jesus Christ, the riches that we have in Christ goes so far over 
beyond that. And so buy gold that's refined in the fire. Number two, buy white clothing. In other words, clothe yourself with Jesus Christ, not with the finery, not with, um, uh, with, uh, with the finest of wool that the world had ever seen back then. Uh, to be naked in the ancient world was uh, meant ultimate humiliation. And so to be the clothed in the finest uh, really gave you status back then. Uh, you remember that when the prodigal son returned, uh, how the father dressed him in, in the finest. Uh, Daniel, you remember he was clothed when he was elevated to second in command, and we could go on and on, but, um, but they were clothed in, in finery that was visible. And what's being counseled here, hey, you know what, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they prided themselves in their magnificent garments, but they were spiritually naked is what he's saying here. Paul says this, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And then finally he says, you know what, buy salve to put on your eyes because you're blind. You see, he's using the strength of that particular city and using it as a spiritual analogy to what's wrong with them. Listen, you, you need to, to take the blinders off. You need spiritual salve on your eyes so that you can see the truth of where you are and where you need to be. And so this is what's being counseled here. And, but I love what he says here. He says, those whom I love, I rebuke. And I discipline. In spite of the fact that this church was very, 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 very quickly dying, he still said that he loved him. He still says that he loved him. And you know what? That gives me hope. Because when I mess up, guess what? Jesus still loves me. The Bible says you confess your sins. Uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so here is God, the picture of God or Jesus Christ saying, hey, listen, I know you're heading down the wrong path. I know that you're almost there. You're blind, you're naked, and, and you're poor spiritually, but yet I love you. I love you. And so um, when it comes to this, you know what? There's a difference between discipline and punishment. And God doesn't punish, but He disciplines us as believers. How many of you have ever been disciplined by God and you know it? You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want. But there's a difference between it because what God disciplines us for our good. Why? To make us more like Him. And so verse 20 is that famous verse, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. See, Jesus Christ wants to enter this church. You know, if I'm far out there in left field as, as, as a believer, you know what? God, Jesus Christ, knocks at the door. Why? Um, because he desires to have fellowship with each and every one of us. And so there's the picture of Jesus standing at the door of knocking, and he'll continue to knock. Aren't you glad that he is a pursuing God? Because he's had to reach out uh, very far for me at times, but yet he continued to reach out. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And then the promise here, again, with each of these churches, there's a promise given, and that's to the true believer. And so to the true believers here in this church, um, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with God on his throne. How cool is that going to be? You remember when Jesus Christ, he sat down at the right hand of the Father when he went to heaven? We're going to sit down with him and rule and reign with him as well. That's the promise then to us as believers, to rule and reign with him. We're going to see that when we get to Revelation chapter 21 back uh, a couple weeks from now. But uh, that's the promise here. Uh, and so the challenge to this church is this. Get rid of your lukewarmness and your lack of commitment. Get hot for him. Get hot. Listen, the majority of people on this strip of land going out into the lake are not in church this morning. They need to be. We need to get hot for him, right? We can't be lukewarm as believers, as individuals, and as a church together. And so that's the warning for this church. But I go back to that verse uh, where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Just like that continual reminder. You, when we mess up, there's the knock. When we're doing good, there's that knock. Continue going. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. There's that continual desire on the part of Jesus Christ to have fellowship and communion with each and every one of us. Uh, but that comes with us remembering. You see, all, all began when Jesus Christ came to this earth, and he willingly gave himself. 
His blood was shed on the cross for you and for me. He died, he was placed in the tomb, but then he rose again. And it's through that shed blood and it's through that broken body on the cross that we can be here this morning, that we can sing praise, that we can sing worship. Why? Because we serve a God who is alive. But sometimes as humans, we forget, don't we? And uh, how many of you are forgetful? Some of you forgot there was church this morning, the empty seats, okay? And, um, but we're to be reminded, and I believe that's one of the reasons why uh, communion was instituted, uh, so that we would remember what Jesus Christ did for us. Uh, the church in Corinth that Paul writes several letters to, uh, they were participating in what we uh, know as the love feast. They would have a love feast, uh, and they would gather together, and they would sing worship, and they would sing praise. But what would happen, uh, they would get drunk on the wine, and then they would gorge themselves with the bread so that when it came time to having communion together, um, all of the food and all the wine was gone. And so it had become a party instead of a celebration and a time of remembrance. And so Paul reprimands them. He says, it's not about that at all. It's about remembering, sincerely uh, remembering what Jesus did for us. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. And uh, they're already forward. I'm going to ask the ushers if they'll just stand here. And uh, what we're going to do, we're going to give out the elements, and then uh, we'll partake of them together. And... Um, and then we'll remember what Jesus did for us. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, i got to stop here. Think about it. Jesus was facing what? Death. I mean, physically as a man, he knew that in a few short hours that he would go through unbelievable agony for you and for me. But yet here he is taking the bread and, of course, equating it to the fact that his body is going to be broken and giving thanks, giving thanks to God the Father. Why? Because he did it with a purpose, that purpose being the salvation of you and the salvation of me. And so here's Jesus now, hours before he was crucified. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body. Now, you remember, the disciples have no idea what he's talking about. All of this is going over their heads at this point. This is my body? What are you talking about, Jesus? And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, for the disciples, they have may have been a little confused. I don't understand what you're talking about, Jesus, but we know, right? We know that Jesus there on the cross, his body was broken and bruised so that 
when that blood was spilled, we could receive forgiveness of sins. And Jesus gave thanks for that. Let's lift the bread together. Let's give thanks for the fact that he gave himself, that his body was broken on the cross for you and for me. Jesus was there in the upper room. That's where this occurred. Uh, Jesus had spent uh, several hours. John's 15, 16, and 17 really give us a more detailed account of what happened there. I don't think they passed the bread and the cup right after the other. I think there was fellowship going on between. And as he was doing it, he was explaining to them uh, the broken body. And then later, uh, they would then pass the cup, maybe a common cup. Uh, where they would just take one cup and, and pass it around. I was thinking of doing that this morning, but <laughs> I don't think anybody would want to do that. I actually was in a church in which we did that, a uh, common cup. It was one time that they did it, that was all. But anyway, uh, in the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper, okay, after they had eaten, saying, this cup is the new covenant or the new promise in my blood. Remember, up to this point, it was the sacrifices that were made at the altar, the shed blood of an animal that received temporary forgiveness of sins. Now, Jesus is saying, this is the new promise in my blood. Why? Because he would come and die once. Not many times like the animals, but just once here. Why? Because you can't get any better than the perfection that comes in Jesus Christ. And so this is the cup of the new covenant or new promise in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we do this to remember what Jesus did for us. And then my favorite line in, in the whole Bible, for all, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, if he's dead, how can he come? What's being said there right there? That he's not going to stay dead. That Jesus is going to come alive, right? And he is alive. And so we, we remember what Jesus did on the cross by his broken body and shed blood. But we do it in remembrance of him. Why? Because we know that he's coming back. And we know that we're going to be reunited with all of those who have gone before. And what a celebration that is going to be, all because of what Jesus did for us there on the cross. And so let's lift our cups together and as we remember and give thanks 
for the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Let's take and drink. Father, we're so thankful, Lord Jesus, this morning as we, Lord, just to take a few moments, Lord, and, and to, to remember, Father, what you did for us, Lord, by the sending of your Son, Jesus, uh, to die on the cross. Father, we hear it so much here in America, Lord. And uh, many homes, Father, have many Bibles, and we hear the message on the radio, we see it on TV, Lord, and we hear it on church, Father, and it's easy to take it for granted, Father. But may we never, ever take for granted, Father, the fact that you loved us, that you sent your Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, and that you rose again, and that you're coming back again, Father. Thank you, Lord, so much. We love you, Lord, the same this afternoon, Father, in your precious name that we pray. And everyone said, hey, listen, we're going to sing one more song. Next week, we're going to be talking about the rapture. And so, good time to bring everyone here. So look around, you see people missing, tell them, hey, you need to be here for this one. Because that's the next big event that's going to be happening for the church. Bill. <laughs>